Yeah, maybe Marc Antoine on, on governance, you wanted to give us a few highlights. Yes, thank you so much uh, uh, to all there. Um, I have one slide perhaps uh, to show, if that's possible. Yes, uh, you may see it right now, exactly. Um, so we are just a few weeks uh, before COP26, and what you see on this slide is the NDCs that we have lined up to the same baseline, because everybody now talks about different baselines, right? So it's very easy to say, oh, I'm, I'm, dec I'm, you know, I'm reducing my greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, but if you take uh, a, a very uh, different baseline, maybe it can even mean you can increase your greenhouse gas emissions. And we've seen a lot of smoke screen, unfortunately, uh, from several countries. But the point is the following. Um, the, so the UK and the EU are the most advanced in the world. Then comes the US, and then, very regrettably, within the OECD family, you have uh, Japan, Canada, and especially Australia, that are really not committed enough. And then, of course, you have the rest of the world, which is a different case, and the emerging economies, etc. But the point is, I think, uh, if you allow me uh, in, in the next few minutes, what I'd like to outline, you know, is what we should achieve uh, over the next two years, and bearing in mind we now have COP26, and what should be achieved within the next five years, uh, knowing that we are uh, not on track to uh, peak our greenhouse gas emissions. Actually, this year we'll post a record high level of growth in greenhouse gas emissions. The world is just uh, turning on everywhere. It's uh, cold fired stations and having them run at, at a much higher utilization levels than what we used to see. Um, and, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, we know since 2015 that we should reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, by quite a sharp level every year, and ever since they have been growing. So we have a huge uh, challenge here. So, so my first point is really, I think the OECD family uh, has to get its house in order, and we need to have Australia really uh, increasing its national determined contribution. And I, I'm turning to you, Minister, because if the UAE can do it <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a large uh, fossil fuel producer, then I think Australia can, should really do it. And I think that will be one of the major tests of uh, President Biden's um, climate leadership aim. If he doesn't get Australia to sign up to a strong NDC, then I think the the, coke, the, the AUKUS uh, uh, deal will, will come into much different light. I mean, clearly climate is much bigger threat than China is. The second point is um, we need to ramp up climate finance, uh, and, and indeed the 100 billion benchmark must be reached. It is obvious that the more we now decarbonize in Europe, uh, the higher the CO2 abatement costs are in Europe. But in the rest of the world, you know, you can still uh, pick up the very low hanging fruits at very low cost and and what is it, what is it about is it about to be us in europe uh, low, uh, decarbonized by 2050 by the loan or is it to really uh, um, uh, have a, a global momentum where everybody basically moves in the same direction and so i think uh, we in europe should also focus more on decarbonizing elsewhere where the abatement costs are lower the third point is um, you know, in Europe these days, uh, and that might be interesting to you here, uh, we are talking a lot about how bad gas is. But the real enemy in the world is still coal. And, uh, and here we have, I think, a big issue because we are not doing enough to fight coal and we are just losing sight of what are the priorities. And, um, and you know, I'm very, uh, I was very positively surprised by uh, the Japan's G7 announcement to stop financing coal as from this year, and the latest one from President Xi. Um, the problem is uh, that's not enough. Now we really have to work on not only, of course, halting any new coal plant, but we have to start working on phasing out the existing coal-fired power generation fleet. And the good news is, there are the technologies, there is the capital, there is the knowledge, everything is there to do it. The problem is, uh, I think we are not still there in terms of governance and policies. And so uh, my proposal to you is uh, we should really pick a couple of priority countries and, and really start you know, focusing in these countries on the most polluting coal-fired power plants. So we have one, for example, in the Balkans near Europe, which if we were closing it, that plan is emitting as much as 15 of the next most emitting plants in Europe. So just one plant and you already do a major step ahead. I'm sure in Russia you can find quite a few, but 
In China, they certainly can find probably about 100 gigawatt that they could actually close. And, uh, but the point is we should really focus here on South Africa, on Indonesia, on India. And on these countries, what we should really need to do is, uh, is really then help them to really unleash the potential that they have for solar, for nuclear, and actually for all the flexibility options that uh, Olivier was alluding to. And again, the capital is there. We just have to line up the regulatory framework, the policy priorities, and, and in several cases, the capital actually. So there needs to be a lot of cheap money made available so that basically Total Energy or, you know, Interrao, I'm looking at you, anybody, you know, who comes up with a good offers can basically deliver. Um, another point is, uh, in my view, that uh, yes, gas is the wrong enemy probably, but uh, we must remind, and I think that might be interesting also to you in the region, there is a big problem with gas, which are the fugitive methane emissions, right? And here, obviously, in the United States, in Australia, in Russia, in Central Asia, and in some parts in the Middle East, but not everywhere, of course, um, I think there is a lot of progress that can be achieved very quickly, sometimes cost efficiently, but still um, we know from the latest IPCC report that actually methane emissions have been contributing almost equally to global warming over the past 30 years than carbon dioxide. So if we address that, we can, I think, make a big step forward. And, uh, and so I wish that, uh, you know, Australia and countries here, et cetera, joined that EU-US uh, initiative on, on reducing uh, green, um, sorry, fugitive methane emissions. And by the way, the US should lead in that and it should also lead in, in phasing out its old coal-fired uh, power plant. A word on uh, agriculture, because there's a lot of methane emissions uh, from the agriculture, et cetera, of course, uh, from, from cattle. And very clearly, uh, you know, we need to, of course, reduce probably our beef consumption. Beef uh, uh, emits per unit of calorie 30 times more CO2 than tofu. That's the point. That's a fact of life. So, you know, we can eat more pork, we can eat more poultry, and we could put a CO2 price on, on, on beef. You know, if you want to eat it, please pay more. I think that could be something that could be done uh, rather easily, at least in our countries. Um, of course, there's uh, the CO2 pricing, which is a core. CO2 pricing is the core instrument to deliver. You can have in the world regulation, incentives, very good. But if you really want to accelerate, you need a CO2 price. And I think, um, unfortunately, there's only Europe that has, a, and the UK, by the way, that have a, a credible one these days. Deforestation, we've talked about it. But there is also room to save CO2 in a hurry because we are here in an urgency. And that means lower speed for road traffic, for maritime traffic. And if you reduce that speed by, you know, on our highways, 110 kilometers per hour. I mean, I'm half German, and Germany the debate is pretty crazy these days. But uh, anyway, you can achieve quite a lot. And, and here also, I think, uh, in the region, and maritime transportation can also deliver on that. A question to you, uh, um, uh, Mr. Boyac. You know, uh, we talk a lot about new hydrogen uh, uses, uh, you know, green hydrogen supplies by but why don't we unite forces within the G20 countries and their economies to probably start, you know, greening the hydrogen that we already use and which we were hinting at. And for example, set us a target that, that by 2030, for example, in our refineries around the world, you know, we try to incorporate at least 30% of uh, green hydrogen. And of course, that will make the gasoline more expensive. But then if there is probably less taxation on that, maybe, you know, that can be afforded. And in any case, uh, gasoline prices will have to rise for various reasons. Um, I think within a five years framework, and I'll, I'll end with a couple of points. Clearly, we need probably to roll out about 1,000 large-scale CCS projects in the world. And you have one very nice one here that is being developed. You have one in, in Norway, but we need thousands of them thousand of them by 2030 and uh, and and it actually looks a lot but it's possible uh, we need clearly the green finance to to get its act together we need to and and we especially I, I think about Europe you know Africa is going to urbanize they're going to have a huge growing cement demand and steel demand the problem is can we allow that this is going to be produced on the basis of 
you know, the cement and the steel plants that we have today. No, it's impossible. Otherwise, all our efforts are vain. So we should gear our development money to basically set out grants to have these low carbon steel mills operating there, because otherwise, you know, um, nobody will be able to pay for that. Of course, it will be a bit more expensive. Um, I think a last point maybe uh, that matters a lot, uh, you know, we need the skills. Uh, and we need to really do much more on the skills. And uh, Arnaud, uh, um, maybe you also already see it, but I followed the German electoral campaign, for example. Everybody's talking about ramping up energy efficiency, renovation of buildings, etc., etc. The problem is, if you call a plumber in Germany, nobody will come because there's nobody. And you will wait three weeks to get a plumber and you will pay a lot of money for the plumber. So how are you planning large-scale building renovation if you can't even get a plumber? <laughs> so that it's a real problem. And so everywhere in the world you're facing an affair. Of course, that requires very specific uh, responses, but obviously that has to be lined up with the rollout of the technologies that are coming. And lastly, and I think that's an important point to remember, we will need much more nuclear, so we need the taxonomy in Brussels to accommodate for that. I mean, it might sound very strange for you here, um, but uh, indeed in Europe uh, there's uh, strong forces that want to stop nuclear when we know that we can't roll out enough renewables and we know that <laughs> without that we can't really reach our decarbonisation targets. So I think that will be uh, also already a major, major achievement. And, you know, there's still fossil fuel subsidies everywhere, including here, and they need to be removed. Uh, that's a long-standing issue, but, uh, you know, that's kind of the basics of decarbonisation, and uh, I hope progress will be made there. Thank you for your attention.